Hi, I'm Barbara. I'm Fred. I'm Maggie. And you're watching Word, Word of, of Mouth. Mouth. This country is planted thick with laws, from coast to coast. Man's laws, not God's. And if you cut them down, and you're just the man to do it, do you really think you could stand upright in the winds that would blow then? Yes. I'd give the devil benefit of the law for my own safety's sake. I have long suspected this. This is the golden calf. The law's your god. Oh, Roper, you're a fool. God's my god. But I find him rather too... Subtle. I don't know where he is. I don't know what he wants. We saw A Man for All Seasons today. A Man for All Seasons is about, well, it's 16th century England. It's basically um, King Henry VIII. Henry VIII is married to Catherine of Aragon of Spain. And Catherine is, is barren. She's infertile. And he's having an affair with uh, Lady Anne Boleyn. And he rationalizes how he can get out of his marriage to Catherine of Aragon because he wants a son. But of course, the Pope won't allow this. So he basically starts the Church of England in order to get rid of one wife and marry Anne Boleyn. And St. Thomas More was a political figure at the time. And he would not go against the king, but would not sanction the marriage. And he paid his price for that. It's one of those plays like, um, you know, like The Crucible that, you know, is about Salem, but it was really focused on the McCarthy hearings and is still relevant today, what's going on in politics. This whole church versus state and, you know, where the law ends and faith begins and all those things are so relevant. Like, it's very metaphorical um, in addition to being about, a very specific, being about a very specific part in history. You had to pay a lot of attention. If you, if you went to scratch something, you missed a pertinent line of dialogue, and then you were cursing yourself because you couldn't catch up. It's hard. It's, it's work. It's, it, it challenges your brain. It's really fascinating, um, partly because Frank Langella is so remarkable in this play. It's, but it is like a history lesson. But it's, it's, like, it's sort of like a, almost like a courtroom thriller meets a history lesson, if that's possible. Frank Langella was phenomenal. He plays the part so well. He, he really, he was a great actor. I, I don't know how else to put it. He's a performer. I wanted to love him and I could see that the audience loved him, but to me he was almost too big for the part. He is a physically powerful presence, but my concept of, of Thomas More is not so much that he was physically powerful as he was the spiritual power. I saw him in Frost Nixon for which he won the Tony. And um, I smell another Tony coming. I mean, he, it, the whole play is about him. And when he's on stage, it just lights up. He has a lot of uh, monologues, a lot of sort of espousing on, you know, his thoughts on law and faith and family and all these things. And he really carries it. He's, he's absolutely remarkable. I've seen him in other things. He's always been very good. But this was, to me, the best performance I've ever seen him in. I have to say, I was, I was a little disappointed because I, I wanted him to blow me away. And he didn't. Well, Patrick Page, you know, he, he was sort of a, he's likable as Henry VIII. And you know what I mean? You see in different forms of pop culture, Henry VIII portrayed in different ways. And he had high energy. He, he had this sort of unfortunate facial hair thing where he, he looked like George Michael on the cover of the older CD, um, which I found a little distracting. But, uh, but he was good. He's just in it for a flash, though. It's so not about Henry VIII. I liked it. I have, I have some criticism, I have to say. I became increasingly annoyed with the fact that Frank Langella tried very hard to have a British accent and no one else did or once in a while they'd slide in and out of it. It really bothered me because there was there was no consistency there and I don't I found that hard. Just from history lessons, I knew you know a little bit about that time in England and sort of the formation of that church, etc. But the specific story of Sir Thomas More, I was not familiar with. And I was raised in the Catholic Church, so I, I know this. In fact, I belong to St. Thomas More Parish in Manhattan. But yes, I knew the history. I think this is a show for anyone with a brain who wants to use it. You can't go there and be flaccid and just sit there with the cotton candy up there. You have to think. You have to be on your toes. You have to have a good night's sleep and eat your Wheaties. It was really good. Yeah. And I'm not that guy that like loves everything, I swear, but it's all about Frank Langella. My husband enjoyed the show, and he's not a, he's more of a light. It's a show that he can enjoy in the afternoon. You can't take him to it at night, though, because he'll fall asleep. You're not bored, ever. 
but you want to keep up with it. It moved very quickly and I was entertained during the whole, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I really did. I think this is one of those shows that people say, oh man, did you ever see Frank Langella play Sir Thomas More and you know, that one season on Broadway in A Man for All Seasons? And people will be bummed if they missed out. I will not give in because I oppose it. I do, not my pride, not my spleen, nor any other of my appetites, but I do. Is there no single sinew in the midst of all this muscle that serves no appetite of Norfolk's, but is just Norfolk? There is. Give that some exercise, my lord, because as you stand, you'll go before your maker in a very ill condition, he'll stand and he'll this. have to think that somewhere back along your pedigree, a bitch got over the wall!